Now, of all the diets out there, of all of them, the paleo diet is the number one Google I'm diet Pam, around I'm the world. Alicia, and today I'm going to cover a topic I have had a lot of requests for, keto or a ketogenic diet. Today I'm going to talk a bit about kale. Kale has gotten kind of trendy. Fasting is not complicated. <laughs> Paleo, keto, kale, kelp, fasting, my fitness pal. I was good today, I ate a carrot. I was bad today, I ate a carrot cake. Why can't Americans just eat? Why do we seem to be in a constant state of argument and angst about our diets? It all goes back to sex and science with a dollop of xenophobia mixed in for good measure. Let's start with sex. Consider that having sex is necessary for the survival of the species. Consider, too, that eating is necessary for the survival of the individual. What do these two conscious, deliberate acts have in common? They are, of course, both pleasurable, and that's so that we will be encouraged to do them again and again. This connection between the stimulation of the sex organs and the stimulation of the taste buds was not lost on Victorian-era, mid-19th century reformers like Sylvester Graham, who went beyond the biblical admonitions against gluttony and preached that all kinds of stimulating and heating substances, high seasoned food, rich dishes, the free use of flesh, meaning meat, and even the excess of aliment all more or less and some to a very great degree increase the concupiscent excitability and sensibility of the genital organs. He favored whole grain flour over refined because the latter was too concentrated and therefore too stimulating. Do not put asunder what God has joined together, he warned. He also thought that meat excited vile tempers and drove men to sexual excess. While some have called Graham the father of public health in the United States because of his emphasis on the prevention rather than treatment of disease, I think it's safe to say that he's also the father of American guilt around food. And by the way, he would hate the graham cracker, which is actually made with refined flour and even worse, with sugar. Graham was quickly followed by equally charismatic and influential people like John Harvey Kellogg, who with his brother Will invented the cornflake, and Horace Fletcher, who was known as the great masticator, which is maybe not what you're thinking. It actually refers to chewing, as you'll see in a few minutes. While Kellogg did claim that sex drained vital energy from the body and should not be engaged in more than once a week, both he and Fletcher were much more interested in the intestines than the genitals. For Kellogg, proper bowel function became paramount, believing, as others did at the time, that constipation resulted in what he called auto-intoxication, leading to more human misery, mental and moral disaster, and even crime than almost any other cause that could be named. Seeing the waste-filled at large intestine as the root of all health problems was not without merit, as it ran parallel to the emerging germ theory of disease. And while Kellogg's solution was to eat lots of whole grains and an otherwise vegetarian diet, saying that It is of far more consequence for a teacher to know whether a child's colon is evacuated regularly and frequently, preferably three times a day, than it is to know he is acquiring proficiency in mathematics. Fletcher preached the value of chewing one's meals, liquids as well as solids, at least a hundred times before swallowing so as to produce as little waste as possible. Their theories represented a shift away from the notion that the right food could save a man's soul to the idea that food could save a man's life. Enjoying eating, though not as actively discouraged, was now taking a back seat to the more important application of what each of them saw as scientific principles. As we move towards the beginning of the 20th century, the study of nutrition literally exploded. Wilbur Atwater determined the protein, fat, and total carbohydrate content of over 3,000 foods and perfected the most accurate method of measuring calorie consumption in the body via the invention of the respiration chamber. 
This was followed about 15 years later by the discovery of the first vitamins, a true game changer for the discipline. What we should eat could now be carefully calculated and converted into specific amounts of meats, grains, etc. And in keeping with his fellow reformers, Atwater said, In our actual practice of eating, we are apt to be influenced too much by taste. We're prone to let natural instinct be overruled by acquired appetite. We need to regulate appetite by reason. In doing this, we may be greatly aided by the knowledge of what our food contains and how it serves the purpose of nutrition. Part of the principle is found in the fact that the human body is a machine. In other words, eat to live, don't live to eat. Running parallel with this was the rise of a discipline initially called domestic science, created by a group of intelligent and ambitious women who, shut out of the opportunities afforded to men by the Industrial Revolution, pivoted instead to apply those same business and scientific principles to their own sphere of influence, the running of the home. Keep in mind that during this time it was not uncommon for even middle-class families to have help, maids and cooks, most of whom were newly arrived immigrants from Europe and elsewhere. And so the woman of the house needed to learn how to manage her staff, as well as how to do the work herself in case they ran off for better paying jobs in the factories. And with the emerging field of nutrition, she needed to be educated on how to feed her family using the domestic scientist concept of scientific cookery, manipulating the preparing of food to meet nutrient needs. Books were filled with table after table of nutrient content, and there was much finger waggling about the right way to eat. Feeling guilty when one ate the wrong thing, which many people were increasingly equating with anything that actually tasted good, began to be firmly entrenched in the American psyche. Domestic science was renamed home economics in the early 1900s, and its areas of interest expanded to the social issues of the day, especially the assimilation of millions of immigrants who had come into the country over the previous several decades. Because what you eat is a measure of your cultural identity, and perhaps even your loyalty to country, immigrants were under tremendous pressure to cast off their old habits and adopt a more American way of eating, especially as the U.S. went to war against some of their countrymen. In addition, the home economists found traditional immigrant dishes, like messy stews and goulashes, difficult to work with because they couldn't quantify how much protein and other important nutrients were in them by counting ounces of beef or cups of potatoes. Better to eat food separated out neatly on a plate. Four ounces of pork, a half a cup of peas, maybe another starchy vegetable, a roll with a pat of butter, all washed down with a glass of milk, what came to be called the square meal. My mother, a Russian immigrant, made me endure the horrors of liver, eggs, and spinach, the superfoods of the day that her home ec teachers told her every child should eat regularly. Although pockets of traditional foodways persisted in the Little Italy's and Chinatowns of urban areas, the teaching of food groups in public schools and the feeding of that square meal to millions of soldiers from immigrant families during World Wars I and II helped to homogenize the American diet as well as Americans' perception of how one should think about eating. That is, less as something passed down from one generation to the next, and more as something created based on what the latest research is telling us about which foods are good, and increasingly which foods are bad. In fact, the first federal nutrition guidelines, which came out in the 1980s, were littered with words like limit and avoid. While we are a nation of immigrants, we have no deep roots in any real food way other than the one created by nutrition scientists over the last hundred years. And that also leaves us vulnerable to the modern day Kellogg's and Fletcher's who preach all kinds of notions about eating that often are about as reasonable as chewing each bite of food a hundred times, yet, like Fletcherizing, still become popular, perhaps in part because the advice from the experts themselves sometimes seems no more credible given its apparent tendency to change. The ultimate irony of all of this is that so many years later, a lot of nutrition professionals are telling us that one of the healthiest eating plans to follow is in fact from Europe, the Mediterranean diet, 
a diet born out of tradition, not test tubes, culture, not clinical trials. It's a food way that one early home economist scoffed at by saying of an immigrant with whom she was working, still eating spaghetti, not assimilated. But even that we can't just leave alone. We have to apply what is seen as the latest research to it, Americanize it, and in the process make it less appealing. We have to replace the wonderful Italian ciabatta with breads made of whole wheat flour. And those fatty cured meats that you'd find on an antipasto platter, salami, prosciutto, speck, along with the salty olives and anchovies. Sorry, it's skinless, boneless chicken breast for us. And what about French pastries and Middle Eastern baklava, also part of the Mediterranean region? Oh no, too much simple sugar. It's perhaps not surprising that while other countries' guidelines often include the word enjoy when talking about what to eat, the tagline for the most recent 2020-2025 U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans is, quote, make every bite count, unquote. How efficient and soulless the epitome of guilt-inducing guidance. Wouldn't Sylvester Graham and the domestic scientists be proud? <laughs> <laughs>